Hey, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, we're going to be covering today. Well, we finished. We were working on equations in quadratic form, uh, nineteen point three. That's what we were doing last week. Um, we're going to finish that up today. I'm going to try and go as far as I possibly can today, um, and then uh, remember that tomorrow is a holiday, right? So we do not have class tomorrow. And that means that we will be meeting again on Wednesday. I'm hoping that Wednesday will be completely review. And then our final exam will be on the 6th. So please make sure um, Wednesday that you're here because any announcements I have about the, the final exam, I'm gonna talk about that test on Wednesday. Today is just gonna be new material, new material. So that's the plan. Um, are there any questions over homework problems or anything that I can help you with before we get started? Anything you want me to go over? Okay. All right. Well, let's get going here then. Um, we were covering again 19.3 equations in quadratic form. And the idea here is that we should know now how to solve a quadratic equation. There was a couple of different methods we had to do that, right? When it came to quadratic equations, where's that file? Right, how do we, how do we solve quadratics, right? We could use a square root property, we factor GCF, complete the square, and then we had the quadratic formula. So those, and then also we can, you know, we can always use the AC method. So we're gonna we're gonna be looking now at some problems of quadratic form. The key word here is that it's quadratic form. That means that the equations we're given are not exactly quadratic, but if we just kind of look at them in the from the right perspective, then we can see that they are quadratic. So <clears throat> to remind you. Um, our standard quadratic equation looks like this, right? We have some number in front of x squared plus some number in front of x plus some number by itself equals zero. And then last class when we started the section, what I wanted you to try and see is that if we can look at an equation where we have a number, right? So the same thing here, a number, but instead of x, we just have something here, okay? Something. And that thing is squared plus another number. And then again, we have that same thing. So here, what's in yellow, these two things have to be the same. And then we have plus some number equals zero. Then we should be able to solve the equation if we make a substitution first. So we'll, we'll start by doing a problem that we did last class. Here's an example. We have an equation, right? We have an equation. It's not quite quadratic because if we were to take this, well, it is quadratic. We'd have to take that and square it though. So I'm gonna see here that this three X plus one matches this three X plus one. This is being squared. And this is to the first power, kind of like what we have up here. This is squared and this is to the first power. So when we see that, I'm gonna make a substitution. I'm gonna say, let, we usually use the, the variable u for the substitution. I'm going to say, let u be 3x minus 1. And then if we do that, everywhere we see a 3x minus 1, I replace it with u. So this thing becomes u squared. Then I have plus 2. And then this thing becomes u. And then minus 8 equals 0. And now I have, now this looks like a quadratic equation but the variable we have here is u instead of x. And then I'm going to think about how I want to solve this. And I have all those different options. Um, I like the idea here of an AC method, where I take the number in front, multiply it by the number in back, I get negative 8. Look at the number in the front here, that's a 2, positive 2. I need to see if I can come up with two numbers that multiply to be negative 8, but add up to be um, positive two. So with enough thought, this would become four and negative two, right? Those two numbers multiply to be negative eight, but add up to be positive two. 
And now that allows me to take this directly down to two sets of parentheses equals zero. And then be careful here, we're gonna use the variable u here, u then plus the four and then u and then minus the two. And because this front number was a one, I don't have to do that special thing that I showed you. Instead, I'm just gonna leave it like that. <clears throat> And now, once we get this factor, right, we have multiplication now, we set each of these factors equal to zero and then solve. So just subtract four on both sides here, we get negative four. Add two on both sides, we get two. Okay, any questions up to that point? Very important step now. Remember, u was actually 3x minus 1. So we're going to replace the u now, replace that u with 3x minus 1. And then we have equals negative 4. And then over here, again, replace the u with 3x minus 1 and then equals 2. And now we have two new equations to solve. These happen to be linear equations, but the equations we get here could be anything. All right. Here it's linear. So I'm going to add 1, add 1. I'll get 3x equals negative 3, and then divide both sides by 3, and you should get negative 1. Then do the same thing on the other one. Add 1 to both sides. You wind up with 3x equals 3, and divide by 3 again, and this time we get positive 1. So those are our two solutions. We did a problem like that in class last time and I had you do one and then I had you do a couple of those for homework so that should not be um, like brand new to you let's look at a new problem though something that's going to be different than this so let's look at this one here were there any que questions on this okay All right, this one, let me make sure I'm recording. Am I recording? Yeah, okay. Um, on this one, well, it doesn't look very quadratic at all because you've got these fractional powers, right? So that right away makes you think, okay, this is not quadratic. But if we, if we look at it just the right way, then it can be quadratic. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract eight on both sides. And the reason I'm doing that is because I wanna get zero on the right-hand side, because all quadratics you have to have equal to zero. So I'm gonna rewrite the problem. I'll have P to the two thirds minus two P to the one third. And then I'll have the minus eight that I subtracted that eight on both sides. And on, on the right-hand side, I'll have equal zero. So that's just first just trying to get it set up like a quadratic. And then this is the key part of the problem. You have to see that this first piece here, p to the 2 thirds, can, can be rewritten as p to the 1 third squared. And that comes from the fact that if we ever have this, it was this property of exponents. If we have a to the n, and then we raise that to the m, we do a to the n times m. So we multiply those two numbers together. So we have to see that this 2 thirds can be rewritten as 1 third times 2. And that's where we get this from. All right, so you have to see that. That's not ob It's not as obvious as the first problem where you said, oh, look at those two things, they match. So when we see that, what we can do now is we can rewrite this as p to the one third, but then squared, then minus two, and I'm gonna put this in parentheses, p to the one third. I don't need that in parentheses, but because I'm gonna, I'm gonna see something that they both match, right? Now it looks like, it looks like this form right here, right? It looks like we have this right here. So we've got some number in front of something that's being squared plus another number in front of something. These two things are the same. And then we have plus a number equals zero. It's exactly what we've got here. 
Now, the number in front here is a one. Okay, so I'm going to now make a substitution. I'm going to let, uh, let u be the p to the one third, but that's what matches. <clears throat> and now I rewrite the problem, replacing p to the one third, sorry, yeah, replacing p to the one third with u. So this becomes u squared, that's the first piece. I don't need the one in front, minus two times u, then minus eight equals zero. And that is actually this very close to what we just had in the previous problem. We had a we had a plus two u minus eight. This one is a minus two u minus eight. So I'm gonna I'm play the same game. I'm gonna take this one in front, multiply over here. I get negative eight. I'm using the AC method again. Then here is a negative two. I need two numbers that multiply to be this, but add up to be this. And it's those same two numbers, four and two, but I'm gonna to have to make the, the four negative this time. That way it'll add up to be negative two. And then I write my two sets of parentheses <clears throat> equals zero. And now I'm using the variable u, I do minus four u plus two. And now, because there's multiplication here between these, I set up two equations. On the first one, I just add four to both sides. And on the second one, I subtract two on both sides. Any questions here? Just remember when you do this, these problems, if you make a substitution, you have to go back. Okay, this is not the answer. We have to solve for P here. What we solve for is U. So now we're gonna go back and we're gonna remember, okay, U, U was, was P, uh, P raised to the one third power. So I replace this with P to the one third, then equals four. And then same thing here, P to the one third equals negative two. And now we have to solve for P. Right in the previous problem, when we did the substitution back right here, we got two little equations and those were linear equations. And so we know how to solve linear equations. We just get the variable by itself, you know, add or subtract something from both sides, divide, whatever we need to do. Here, these are not linear equations, but we want to get what, you know, we want to get P by itself. Right now it's being raised to the one third. So what I'm going to do to get that. Um, to get just p is I'm going to take this p to the one third, and I'm going to raise this side of the equation to the third power. And the reason I'm doing that is because I know if I take one third and I multiply by three, I'm going to get one, right? So when I multiply these two powers, I'll just get a one, which would give me just p here on, on the left-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, I had equals four, but Whatever, you know, if I raise the left-hand side to the third power, I have to do the same thing to the right-hand side. So I'm raising both sides of the equation to the, to the um, third power. And then four to the third power is 64. It's four times four times four. So that's one answer, P is 64. And then the other one, we have to do the other equation still. I'm gonna do the same, same idea. I'm gonna take P to the one third equals negative two. I'm going to raise both sides of the equation to the third power. On the left-hand side, I just get P. On the right-hand side, I've got to do negative two times negative two times negative two. That turns out to be a negative number because we have three negatives and two times two times two is eight. So we get P is negative eight. So those are our two solutions. All right. Any questions? All right. I will let you practice one. I'm going to do a couple of these first, and then I'm going to let you practice a few. So look at this one. This is the next, the next type here. Go to a new page here. Okay, 
Look at this one right here. So for this one, again, I have an equation, right? That's good. I've got it equal to zero already, so I don't need to move anything over. But now I need to see, is there any way that I can write this as something squared, you know, A times something squared plus B times something plus C equals zero. And I need whatever's in here to match. And I notice here, and this is the part that's, I guess, challenging for some students is to notice what it is that you can put in there for the yellow. So the key here is to realize that X is the same as the square root of X squared, right? Because if you take the square root of X and you square it, the square root and the square go away and you just get X. So I'm going to rewrite that first term X as, so I'm rewriting it now. It's the whole thing here is the square root of X squared minus, I'm gonna put in parentheses again, the square root of X minus 12 equals zero. And now you see that these two things match just like we needed in this form. So, you know, these, these last two, this one and the one I did before, this thing in yellow is not just like right there in front of your face. You have to actually think a little bit and figure out how you can get those things to actually match. And now I'm gonna make my substitution. Let's let u be the square root of x. If we do that, then it becomes u squared minus just u and then minus 12 equals zero. And we've been pretty fortunate so far that the AC method has been working. But remember that you could always use the quadratic formula here if you, if you needed to. All right, we'll probably run into some problems here where we'll need quadratic formula. Just for now, I think AC is gonna work. If I multiply here to here, I get negative 12. And then the number in front of the middle one is negative, that's a one, so negative one there. We need two numbers that add up to be this, but multiply to be this. And those numbers are negative four and positive three. Negative four times three is negative 12, negative four plus three is negative one. And so I should be able to factor this as, let's see, u minus four, u plus three. And remember again, don't put x there, right? Your variable is u, so keep u here. Set each of those factors equal to zero. Add four to both sides. Subtract three on both sides. So we've got our two solutions for u. Now we need to go back and remember, well, what was u? u is root x, right? So I'm gonna replace this u with root x equals four, and then replace this right here with root x equals negative three. Now, each one of these, each one of these by themselves are examples of radical equations. Or if you want, you could say they're square root equations. And we've actually talked about how to solve these. All right. When you, let me see if I can show you real quick. Uh, here we go, 18.7. Solving equations containing radicals. All right. I would like to see if we can find that real quick. Solving equations. Here we go. Solving equations containing radicals. So if you go back and look at the radical equation um, steps, the big thing I want you to remember is that you had to check your solutions. You had to check your answers. All right. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm going to solve this using this technique, but I want to check my answers. So the technique was to isolate the radical, raise both sides of the equation to a power that would make the, the, the root go away, solve whatever's there, and then check your answer. So I'm going to look at this first one. I'm going the, the square root of x equals four. The, the radical is already isolated, it's by itself. I am going to square both sides. And when I square the x square, sorry, when I square the square root of x, I just get x. And on the right side, I get 16. So that looks like an answer so far. On this one, um, I do the same thing. Okay, I take the square root of x equals negative 3. I square both sides. And I get x equals 9. So these are my two uh, potential solutions. I don't know if they are actually correct yet. What I'm gonna need to do, here's the problem. I need to go back and check these into the original equation. So let me put the original equation here. Okay, let me check. So first, let me check what happens if I try x is equal to 16. All right, so I'm gonna rewrite this equation. I'm gonna replace x with 16. So I get 16 minus the square root of 16 minus 12 equals zero. And the question is whether or not that's true or not. Well, that's 16 minus the square root of 16 is four and minus 12 equals zero. I don't know if that's true yet. Let me see. Yes, this works. I get 16 minus four is 12, 12 take away 12 is zero. That is true. So this solution works for sure. Now let me check x equals nine. So I plug in nine minus the square root of nine minus 12 equals zero. That's nine, take away square root of nine is three minus 12. The question is, does this equal zero, right? And this does not work. You do not get zero if you work out that left-hand side. So this is not true, which means I'm going to throw away this solution. So we only have one answer, square root of 16. I mean, sorry, x is 16. Now you might be asking, why didn't I do this on the last problem, right? When I had this and I raised both sides to the third power, why didn't I check these answers? Well, it, we always need to check our answers. Let me say it another way. If this number that we raise on both sides, if it's odd, we don't need to worry about checking our answers. If it's even, we do. And on the problem we just did, we raised both sides to the two. That's an even number. And the, and the issue is that when you square something, it always turns out to be positive. So we need to check always when we're raising something to, the, to an even power. If it's odd, you can trust your answers are okay. All right, so I've done two problems here, two different types of problems. I'd like to give you the opportunity to try so on your own. So let me copy these. There's the first one. And then the second one. Okay, there you go. I want you to try and work both those problems out. Um, and then what I like to do is something a little different. Um, when you're done, okay, when you're done in the chat, I'd like for you to put something like this. Put two, uh, why is that not typing two? And then put your answers, y equals whatever you get. You know, if you get another answer, put comma. 
um, y equals, and then whatever you get. And then put three, and then you'll be solving for z. So put z equals, and then whatever. And I don't know how many answers you're going to have for each of these. You might have more than one. Depends. So, but I'd like for you to do that in the chat. And that way I'll know when you're done. So if you finish number two, go ahead and put your answers in. And then you can come back and finish number three and put your answers in. So you can do two chats if you want. All right, let's see how long it takes people to start getting this done. Good luck.
Okay, we're starting to get some answers here. Some of you are getting a little bit stuck. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna show my work here in about a minute. Let me give you one more minute and I'm gonna show my work and I'll let you look through it. And then I'll answer any questions. Yeah, I'm going to share my work here. So on the first equation, you get two solutions, 64 and negative 27. You don't need to check those answers because you cube both sides of the equation. And that's an odd power, so you don't need to check those. On the second equation, you should get two solutions for negative one, but this time you do have to check your answers because you square both sides. And when you check, you'll see that um, it only works when Z is four. So take a look at that. I know some of you were having a little bit of trouble on, on one of these, so. I'll give you about 30 seconds to look at those and then I'll answer any questions.
Okay, are we good? Do I need to talk about any of this? From the chat, I can see a lot of you got it, so or got both of them, so good. Um, some others may have had some trouble with the, the cubing or the squaring. Just be careful with your signs. All right, we're going to still continue. Same section. We're going to look at a different type of problem. It's, I mean, it's the same idea, but it just looks different. So here we go. So we're going to solve this equation. Well, this is this is obviously not quadratic because you got a fourth power here, right? Um, but we still do have three terms and we have it equals zero. So maybe there's a way that we can do this. I'm trying to see, is there a way I can write this as A and then something squared plus B and then something to the first power then plus C equals zero. And really I'm thinking that that X squared is gonna go here. So I need to be able to rewrite this probably to make it uh, fourth power. If I had to use that X squared there and this X squared here, it should work. So let me rewrite everything first. All right, we've got four. And I'm realizing that X to the fourth can be rewritten as X squared squared plus seven, then X times X squared, and then minus two, and then equals zero. Equals zero. All right, and these two things match. So that's what I'm going to let my U be. Let U be X squared. And by the way, if this problem, if in the beginning of this problem, if, if this variable was U already, then of course, when we make a substitution, we'd have to use a different variable. Like we could say, okay, let W be equal to U squared or something. You would never want to use U twice, right? Um, that hasn't happened, I'm just pointing it out. All right, so now I rewrite the problem. It's four U squared plus seven U minus two equals zero. And let's see if we can do AC method again. Let's see, four times negative two, that's negative eight. Be two numbers that multiply to be this and add up to be seven. Yeah, I think I'm going to be able to get that eight and negative one. Eight and negative one. So I'm going to have here my factor, my factoring. But this time, look at our A here was a four. So we have to pay attention to that when we do our factoring here. I'm going to leave some space in front u plus eight, u minus one. And I think what makes the most sense is if I put the four underneath the eight and in front of the u here. If I do that, things should work out because eight divided by four is two. And then over here, just leave it alone. Now, once I'm, I've gotten here, I just set these both equal to zero and just solve these, subtract two on both sides. And here I'm gonna add one to both sides and then I'm going to divide by four. So I'm gonna get a fraction here. And now at this point, I need to replace u with what it was. Remember, u was x squared. So this becomes x squared is negative 2. And this becomes x squared is 1 fourth. Any questions up to this point? So here I'm trying to solve for x now, to, I have x squared. So to get rid of the x squared, I have to take the square root on both sides of the equation. We've done this before. We did this, this was actually what we call the square root property. Just remember you have to do plus or minus. And then you have to do the same thing here. You're gonna take square root and you have to do plus or minus. Remember, we only do plus or minus when we're doing an even root on both sides. So a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root, then we have to do plus or minus. If you did like cube root, then you'd only do plus. You don't do plus and minus. 
So what happens here is we just get the, the root and the square go away, we just get x. Here we have two answers, plus or minus the square root of negative two. We'll talk about that in a minute. Over here, we have x equals, and then again, plus or minus the square root of one fourth. Let's do the one on the right first, because it's the one that I think is a little more straightforward. For this one, I'm gonna say x equals plus or minus, because it's a fraction, I can do the square root of the top and bottom separately. And that gives me plus or minus the square root of one is one and the square root of four is two. So I have two answers there, positive one half and negative one half. On the other one, I can't take the square root of two and it's a negative. So what I'm gonna have to do is remember that square roots of negatives means that we're gonna have the imaginary thing. So I'm gonna rewrite this as the square root of two times the square root of negative one. That's plus or minus square root of two. And then remember the square root of negative one is i. Or you could write it with the i in front of the root two. That's the way most, most uh, books will write it that way. And so we have two answers here, but they're, they're complex numbers or imaginary numbers. Um, I need to go back and look if it said, to get just the real solutions or not? No, it just says solve the equation. Sorry, it just says solve the, solve the equation. It doesn't say, you know, just give me real answers. So the answers here, you can see here how they wrote them like this. They separated them. They did positive a half, negative a half, positive i root two, negative i root two. Okay, questions? All right. I'm gonna do another one. It's gonna be a slightly different problem. And then I'll give you two, you know, I'll give you one of each to try it on your own. And this will be the last problem of the section. So we'll be ready to move into the next section after this one. All right, so this problem is gonna look different. If you go back and look in our notes, we actually did something like this already. This was, uh, where is it? It's way back here. Where is it? This had to do with solving equations containing rationals. So this is where we had um, equations where you have fractions involved, where your variable could appear on the top or bottom. So we did this back in 15.6, but all the problems we did in 15.6, when we solved them, we never got a quadratic ever. So now this problem, we're gonna wind up having to solve a quadratic at some point. So when I begin this problem, I'm not gonna be doing what we've been doing. You know how I've been trying to say, oh, that looks like something squared, try and rewrite it as a quadratic equation. I'm not gonna do that method to start. To start, I'm gonna do the method for solving a rational equation, which is to find, right, find your LCD first, your, least common denominator. So I look at my denominators of everything here. I have to look at all the fractions. So I look at that one on the right-hand side as a fraction one over one. I look at all these denominators and I think about what I can do to find a common denominator. So I know that my LCD, I'm gonna need a Y plus two. I'm also gonna need a Y minus one. And I don't need to put a one here because there's always a one next to everything. So I'm not gonna put a one there. So there's my LCD. I need a Y plus two and a Y minus one. Now let's see if you remember what to do here. Now the next step, let me rewrite everything. We take that LCD and we multiply both sides of the equation, multiply by the LCD. Okay, so we're multiplying both sides of the equation by that least common denominator. And let's talk about what happens. When I multiply here to here, I'll write it out because it's been a while. What happens is I get y plus two times y minus one times three y, but that's all over 
the denominator y plus two. So it's really like I'm looking at this as like a fraction over one and I'm just multiplying straight across. So these two things times three y is up here and then the one times y plus two is on the bottom. Hold on just a second, let me. Now I'm going to multiply this times this. So I'm distributing there. I'm going to have a minus, and then I'm going to have y plus 2 times y minus 1 times 2. And that's all over my y plus 1. And then equals, and then on my right-hand side, I have to multiply these together, but that 1 really has no impact on that. So it's just y plus 2 times y plus or y minus one. Okay, that's what happens when I multiply through by the LCD. And the whole reason I did this is because we should get no fractions at the end of this. Notice the y plus twos cancel here, the y minus ones cancel here. So what you're left with is the y minus one on top times the three y. Then minus over here, we have a y plus two times the two. And on the right, we've got the y plus two times the y minus one. Okay, no more fractions, which was the whole point of that first step. Now we've got to solve this equation. And right now it's hard to, hard to see what it is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start multiplying. I'm gonna distribute through this way. So when I multiply three y times y, I get three y squared. Then 3y times negative 1, I get minus 3y. Now be careful with this next multiplication here. This times this, and this times this. If I do that, let me show you above what I get. I get 2y plus 4. 2y plus 4. But I have to subtract that, right? Which is going to give me a minus 2y and a minus four. So they both become negative because of that negative sign out front. Be careful, that's a, that's a place that a lot of students make a mistake. And then on the right-hand side, I'm gonna FOIL. Y times Y, Y squared. Y times negative one, negative Y. Two times Y is two Y. And two times negative one is negative two. Now I should be able to collect like terms. My left-hand side is 3y squared minus 5y minus 4. And on the right-hand side, I get y squared uh, plus y minus 2. That's putting these two together. So I put those two together. All right, that gave me this. And then that gave me this. OK. We finally have the quadratic equation, right? That's an equation that has uh, y squared in it. Let's get everything to one side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract y squared, subtract y and add two on both sides. Subtract y squared, subtract y, add two. If I do that, the whole right side goes away and becomes zero. The left side, we just do subtraction. 3y squared minus y squared is 2y squared. 5y minus y is 6y. And then negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. All right, any questions? I know there's a lot, a lot we've done so far. I'm going to try and solve this. Let me try AC method. If I do 2 times negative 2, I get negative 4. I need two numbers that multiply to be negative 4, but add up to be negative 6. And I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, this is not going to happen. I can't come up with two numbers that do that, right? The only thing I have is like one and negative four, I can do negative one and positive four, but those two numbers don't add up to be negative six. I can do two and negative two. That's about it. And nothing there adds up to be negative six. So AC method's not gonna work. 
So that's okay. I'm going to bring in the quadratic formula. We could also complete the square, but we already said the quadratic formula is much, um, I guess, cleaner. It's just plug and chug. So the quadratic formula says that the solutions to this equation are going to be y equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2a. Now remember that a here, right, is 2, b is the negative 6, and c is the negative, yeah, the negative 2. So I'm just going to be plugging those numbers into this and grinding out the solution. Let me put it over here. y equals negative b for us would be the opposite of negative 6, would be, which would be positive 6, plus or minus the square root of, okay, b squared, I'm going to square negative 6 and get positive 36, minus 4 times a, which was 2, times c, which was negative 2, and then all of that over 2 times a, but a was 2. This will be equal to 6 plus or minus square root 36. Now, it's going to be a plus here. And the reason there's a plus is because I see two negative signs. Two negatives together would become a plus. And now I'm just going to multiply the numbers I had there, 4, 2, and 2. I'm going to ignore the signs. It's 4 times 2 times 2. That should be 16. So I'm adding 16 in there. And then all of this over 2 times 2, which is 4. This is 6 plus or minus the square root of, all right, 36 uh, plus 16 is 52, all over 4. And that answer is perfectly fine with me on the test we take on Thursday. You can just leave that like that. My guess is that they're not going to leave it like that. They're going to see, they're going to probably see if they can break 52 down. Um, four goes in there 13 times. Yeah, four goes into 52 13 times. So they would break down the square root of 52 to be the square root of four times 13. And that's square root of four times square root of 13. And that becomes 2 root 13. My guess is that's what they're going to do is rewrite the root uh, 52 as 2 root 13. If we do that, it becomes 6 plus or minus 2 root 13 all over 4. And then I'm sure that they're also going to pull a GCF out of the top. They're going to notice that you can pull a 2 out of both the 6 and the 2. So they're probably going to pull, pull a 2 out on top. Make that three plus or minus the two comes out. So there's really a one in front of that root 13, which I'm not going to write the one. I'm just going to leave it like that. And then all that over four. And the final step is you could reduce that and make that a two down there. So you should get two answers, three plus or minus root 13, root 13 all over two. And just remember that's two different answers. Wow, that's a lot of work, right? That is a lot of work. A lot of places to make mistakes. Let's see if I, I don't even think I can fit it all on one screen without zooming way out. I mean, look at what we had to do, right? We had to find an LCD, multiply both sides by the LCD to clear the fractions. Once we cleared the fractions, we cleaned everything up, got a quadratic moved everything to one side, tried the AC method, it didn't work. Go to the quadratic formula, try not to make any mistakes with the signs. And then here, root 52, we had to break it down. Then see a GCF. Yeah. All right, you ready to try? I'm gonna give you two problems now. Let's try um, first one that's similar to the one that we did before this one. Oops, hold on. Do that one. And then this one I think is going to probably take a little while. See how you do though. 
And same thing as before. If you finish these, see about um, putting your answers in the chat. Okay, good luck. Uh, we'll go probably 10 to 15 minutes here.
Right. Some of y'all are starting to get these. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my put my answers up um, in my work, and let's see if if it helps. If you're stuck on any particular step, you can kind of reference what I've done, and then we'll talk about it. I'll give you still another five minutes. So there's my work. Do me a favor. Um, when you feel like you're done, you understand what's going on here. Um, go ahead and just let me know so we can move on. I will point out on the second problem, there was a critical step right here. I'm circling here in blue. And what I did is I saw that the right-hand side had two T squared and the left-hand side had one T squared. So I decided to subtract T squared on both sides instead of subtracting two T squared on both sides. I did that intentionally so that, um, sorry, it's actually the next line, this line right here. Um, I did that so, so that when I subtracted T squared on both sides, I would get a positive T squared, as opposed to if I had done it the other way and subtracted two T squared on both sides, I would have had a negative. And it just would have made my quadratic formula just a little bit trickier because I would have, or more tricky because I would have had a negative A, negative one A, or A would have been negative one. So either way, you should get the same answer. I'm just kind of pointing that out. You could have gone both ways there. So, so far, six of you are kind of ready to move on. Uh, just answer that poll question when, you, when you're ready to move. I'll wait for a few more of you.
Okay. I don't think that's good. Um, any last questions on this? All right, well, that concludes this section. So we are now officially done with, um, where is it? Uh, equations in quadratic form, right? And doing U substitution. So we're, we're gonna move on to graphing now. So we're really gonna be shifting gears here in terms of what we're trying to achieve. We're now gonna look at how we graph quadratics, all right? so. Um, instead of looking at an equation we're trying to solve, we're going to be looking at a function that is defined to be a quadratic function, and then just look at what the what the graphs of these look like. So um, I kind of am going to go a little bit different than the uh, ebook does. We're going to wind up with the same information at the end, but the way that I approach it's a little different. So quadratics, when it comes to quadratic functions. There's normally two forms that you will see them in, all right? There's two forms. The first form is called the standard form. And the second form is called the vertex form. So let me let me first write what that what these two forms look like generally, and then I'll give you specific examples. So standard form would be written this way. It is a function, so we write f of x, and then the function is defined to be a x squared plus b times x plus c. That's called the standard form of a quadratic function. So that should look very familiar to you. Right. If we ignore this part, oops, that erased that. That's weird. Okay. If we ignore that part completely, then we can see that ax squared plus bx plus c is, is what we've kind of been working with, but we've been working with equations, right? So we are now getting rid of the equation and we're defining a function to be equal to that quadratic expression. That's your standard form. Now, of course, here we have some, some conditions. The A can't be zero because if A is zero, it completely kills that off. And then you don't have quadratic anymore. So we have to have that A is not zero. And then we also have that B and we also have that B and C are any numbers, any numbers. So it is possible for B or C to be, um, you know, zero. We just can't have A as zero. So let me give you some specific examples right underneath this of standard form. So here we go. How about f of x equals x squared minus 4x minus 5. That is a quadratic function written in standard form. Written this way, we can identify A is 1, B is negative 4, and C is negative 5, right? We can see that. Let me change that to. Okay, that's what we can tell. That's the first example. Let me give you another example. How about this? Just that. That's still a quadratic function in standard form, except now A is one, B is negative four, and C, since we don't have a constant by itself, it's really there. There's like, it's like a plus zero here, but we wouldn't write that. So that's why C is zero there. Here's another example, f of x equals x squared minus five. That again, 
okay, is one. This time we don't have an X term. So we imagine that there's a zero in front of an X here and then C is negative five. Hold on just a second. All right. All right, so those are those are three different ways we could see the standard form. Look at look at the difference between these these three forms. This one, you have three terms, right? You have an x squared term, an x term, and a number. This one, you have two terms. You have an x squared and then you have an x term. And this one, you have two terms. You have an x squared and then a number. It is also possible <clears throat> to have this form where you have something like this, I don't know, five x squared. And in that case, a is five, the number in front of x squared is five, not one. And both your b and your c are both zero. And those are the only ways that you could possibly see a quadratic in standard form. You're either, you're either going to have all three terms, all three terms, or you're going to have two terms, or you're going to have one term. But in every single one of these, you're, you have to have an x squared in, in these to be a quadratic. The question is whether or not you've got anything else. Okay, that's standard form. Now let's look at the other form, which is called vertex form. So for vertex form, it looks like this. F of X equals A parentheses X minus, that's a minus sign, H, that, that whole thing squared plus K. Here, A of course cannot be zero again. If A is zero, it would kill off everything here and you would just have a number by itself. So that, that can't be the case. And then we have that H and K can be any numbers. And what students will ask right away when we, we introduce these two forms is like, why do we have two different forms? Well. It just depends on the problem. And sometimes vertex form is better to work with. Sometimes standard form is better to work with. It just depends. And there's a way to go from one to the other. We do have a way of switching back and forth between these two forms. I'm gonna show you how to do it. But let me give you some examples of your vertex form. So you could have something like this. Um, let's go with uh, two, X, uh, let me go with, let me go with plus three squared. And then let's go minus eight. So be careful here. A here is the number in front of everything. That's a two. The H, be real careful because in the formula, there's a minus here. And right here we have a plus. So we have to look at this as if we're doing minus negative three, right? Plus three is the same as subtracting a negative. So that means our H is actually negative three. So H is always the opposite of the number you see inside that parentheses. And then the K is just whatever number we see out there, which in this case is negative eight. I'll give you another example. If we had this. How about just that? Well, A here would be two. The H would still be negative three, but see, we don't have a number out here on the outside. We have to imagine that there's really a plus zero here which would mean that our K is zero. So that would be that form. Uh, let's do another one. How about, 
Let's go with two and then let me just write X squared and then minus eight like that. This one's a little tricky because what you have to see is that we have this two and then inside there's not really parentheses but we have to look at that as if it's an X minus zero squared then minus eight. So that X squared right here, this X, whoa, what the hell? That X squared right there is really X minus nothing squared. And that's how we can identify what uh, the H is. So A is still two here. The H here is zero. And then our K is negative eight. Let me give you one more. What if we just have two X squared? Well, if we have two X squared, we could say here that A is two. And for the same reason as the one before, H is zero still, and we don't have a K out there, so K is zero. So we have these, all these different variations, okay? Standard form versus vertex form. So we are going to start by talking about vertex form, right? Even though I wrote standard form first, we're going to start with vertex form. We're going to start to see what it is the graph of these functions look like, all right? So what I've done is I've put together a little um, animation, and, and we haven't had a break. So why don't we take a quick five minute break? Um, I'm going to launch the poll. And I'm just so I can keep track of time and I'll put it on the screen so you can see the little clock running here, five minutes. All right, um, let's take five minutes and we'll come back and we'll start graphing these quadratic functions.
Okay, everyone, sorry about that. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get going here. Um, all right, so we've got these two forms, standard form and vertex form. And we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at the vertex form first. And I have this um, animation for you to kind of show you over here. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So what I've done is I'm using this program called Desmos and I've typed in the generic vertex form for a parabola here, f of x equals a times x minus a squared plus k. And what this allows me to do is change the values of a, h, and k in real time. So right now, what you're looking at, okay, what you're looking at, the a is one, the h is zero, and the k is zero. So if I write that function, that's f of x equals a is one, h is zero, and k is zero. So that's really just one times x, which is just, I'm sorry, x squared, which is just x squared. So that's what you're looking at right now. f of x equals x squared. That's the graph that you see here. So it looks like a u, right? It looks like a u and it's kind of going kind of upwards, right? It has a lowest point, right? It has a lowest point there. And it looks like if you were to draw a kind of like an imaginary line right down the middle through that point, this, this thing looks like a reflection of itself. Like if you were to take the left side and reflect it over, you would get the right side. This shape, this shape of this graph is called a parabola. All right. This point, the lowest point right there is called the vertex. And this blue line, which is not part of our graph, it's not actually part of the graph, it's just this imaginary line down the middle, is called the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry. Let me copy this real quick and I'm gonna, so I can have it because I'm about to erase it. Put this on a new page for us here. Let me clear this out. All right, so that's what we had with f of x equals x squared, that's what we had. Now let me go back to that picture here and let me start with a. I'm gonna start adjusting the value of a and I want you to pay attention to what happens to this parabola. I'm gonna let a get bigger first. So let's make a two. Now let's make a three, now four, five. So the A, the bigger it gets, the more narrow the parabola gets, right? It gets narrow. If I make the A go to, let me go back to one. Let's see what happens if I let A be a fraction. I wanna make some restrictions here, hold on. Okay, so what if I make a b a fraction, like point, points, point 0.9, point 0.8, point 0.7, I mean, point 0.5, point 0.4? Do you see that it's widening out, right? So if the number in front, this a that's in front here, if that a gets bigger, the, the parabola gets narrow. If that a gets small, right, then it gets like widened out. Now, what happens if A becomes zero? Well, if A is zero, it's no longer a problem because you don't, there are no longer quadratic function because we remember we said A had to be zero, it couldn't be zero. So we're gonna ignore that. Let me look at some negative values. If I make them negative, look what happens. The parabola now goes down instead of up. And then the bigger negative it becomes, the more narrow it becomes on the negative, like going down. So if we have a positive A, the parabola goes like that. If we have a negative A, the parabola goes like that. So A controls, A controls whether or not your parabola goes up or down. And it also controls the width. That's what A does. Now let's look at what H does. So H is this number inside of, with the um, X inside the parentheses. 
So when I make H get bigger, let's see what happens. Right now, H is zero. If I make H get bigger, like let's make H one, look what happens to the graph. It moves to the right one, right? If I make H two, it moves to the right two. Three, four, five. So look, H controls the left and the right of the parabola, right? So A controls the up and down in the narrowness and width of the graph. H controls the left and right of the graph. And then of course, K, as you might suspect, controls the up and the down, all right? So I'm gonna plot a point here. I want this point to be um, M, oops. Um, oh no, you know what? I don't want it to be that, sorry. I want it to be, okay. what the heck? There we go. Okay, so that point right there, that point right there is the point that we call the vertex. And the H controls the left and right of that point, and the K controls the up and down, right? So notice, notice um, I have it showing you the, the value of that point. That point is the point four, three. Notice H is four and K is three, right? That's the point four, three. Or I can move to the other side, negative five, negative two. Here, H is negative five, K is negative two. So that's what's nice about the vertex form. With the vertex form, the A is controlling the up and down of the parabola and, the, and its width. And then the H and K just controls your left and your right. So let me, let me write this down, okay? So in vertex form, so if F of X, equals a and then times x minus h squared plus k, then that means we're gonna have one of two scenarios. Either we're gonna have a parabola that opens up like this, where this point, right? That point is the point h k, that's our vertex. Here, A would have to be a positive number, and I know that because this thing opens up. Or we can have A is negative number, and then our parabola would open down like this, and we'd have a vertex somewhere up here. It doesn't have to be on the y-axis, but that would also be our HK. That's our vertex. So that's the beauty of the... Um, vertex form of a quadratic is that if somebody gives you that, it's easy, if someone gives you the vertex form, it's very easy to draw a graph. So let me, let me get, let's do an actual example. So let's say I wanted you to sketch the graph of this function, f of x equals negative two parentheses x um, plus three, and then squared and then plus eight. The first thing I notice is that this is in your vertex form, right? This is in the, the form, I'll, I'll put it back up there. It's in this form vertex, right? It's not in standard form. So because it's in vertex form, I can tell a lot of things right now. I know, first of all, A is negative two. Right, And what that tells me is that this opens down, which means that my parabola has got to look like this with my vertex being here at the top somewhere. Then this number right here, if I take the opposite of it, that's my H. So H is negative three. And then if I look at this number here, that's my K, my K is, positive eight. So on the H, remember, you take the opposite of what you see. On the K, it's just whatever number you see. 
And what that tells me is that this point right here is always HK. For us here is the point negative three, eight. So if I wanted to sketch this, right, sketch this, I could do it pretty quickly. I would go over here, right, go like this. And then I go to the left three, one, two, three, negative three. I go up eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I would put a point right there. And once I have that point, I know that it looks like a U that goes like this. Now, right now, I'm not concerned about trying to figure out how wide it is. I'm just trying to get a basic idea of whether or not this thing opens up or down and whether or not, um, or, or whether or not it opens up or down and what the vertex is. Also, right down the middle of that point, we have the, that imaginary line called the axis of symmetry. And in this particular case, it's a vertical line. So any vertical line can be defined by writing x equals and then some number. And notice that the x value here is negative three. So x equals negative three is my axis of symmetry. I'm gonna go back to the uh, picture here in just about 10 seconds. And I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make H negative three, I'm gonna make K eight, and I'm gonna graph this and everything should look kind of like our picture. So negative three and eight, I need to change something here. Yeah, okay, so A was negative two. A was negative two. H was three, uh, sorry, negative three, and K was positive eight. There we go. That's the graph. Now I'm also going to have it graph X equals negative three, and I'm going to make that a dotted orange line like that. That's our axis of symmetry. So you can see that this parabola is a mirror image of itself over that line. So this is pretty convenient, right? I mean, like this form makes it really easy to draw a picture because everything you just, you have all the numbers there. All right, why don't I give you one? I'm just gonna see if you can do a quick sketch of one. So if I give you, if f of x equals, let's go four times x minus three squared, minus um, 36. Uh, no, that's too big. Let me, let me just do minus uh, eight. We'll do that. Okay, so here's what I want. I'm gonna ask you first of all, does it open up or down? Second thing, find the vertex. Third thing, sketch it. Fourth thing, find the equation of the axis of symmetry. Okay, uh, let me know when you're done.
Okay. So it opens up, right? Because A is four and that's a positive number. The vertex is the point three, negative eight. So the opposite of what we see there and then this number exactly, that's your H, that's your K. Um, well, the H is the opposite, right? Opposite of this. And then our sketch of this, I'll show you in a second. The axis of symmetry. Let's look at the sketch first. There's the sketch. I go to four, negative eight. I put a dot. Then I draw a U going up. And then I draw my axis of symmetry, which goes through X equals four. So this should be X equals four is the equation. The, the axis of symmetry will always be X equals H. Whatever the, um, sorry, what, why did I, I wrote that down, hold on. Is this the right problem? Yeah, this is the problem I gave you. I think I graphed the wrong one, hold on. I did, I graphed the wrong problem, sorry. There we go, it was X equals, no, there we go, that was it. It was three, eight, right? I accidentally put the A for the, for the H. So X equals, this will be always be what H is. So in this case, it's three. Are there any questions on that? So if you're given a, a quadratic function in, in vertex form, it's pretty easy to draw a picture. Um, now, before I continue, I wanna just briefly talk about why parabolas are actually important to us, like in the real world. So I have a couple of little examples to show you. Um, one of the first things that you should know about parabolas is that if you throw an object through the air, right? Stand there, throw a ball, you know, any, any object traveling in the air, okay, is going to travel in a parabolic shape. So if I throw, let's say a basketball, right? Oh, that's a video. But if I shoot a basketball, once it leaves my hand, it's gonna travel in this arc and that arc is always gonna be a parabola. It's not a circle, it's not part of a circle, it's part of a parabola. So quadratic functions are extremely important in the real world because we can actually predict where things are gonna be. Once we know what the function is, we can actually predict where that ball is gonna be at every point in time. Another application of this is um, satellite dishes, right? So all satellite dishes use this. This is a good picture of a satellite dish here. This is an old school one. But this shape, this, this thing in the back here is a parabolic shape. It sh if you look at it from the side, it looks like a parabola and it looks like this. Oh, that's not a good picture. Here, here's a good picture. So it's like a curve, right? That's parabolic. And, and the good thing about a, par a parabola is that when things like when um, light comes in or whatever it is comes in, hits the dish, it reflects off in every single um, ray of light that comes in will reflect to a single point called the focus. So all it's like everything gets amplified down to one point. And so that's where you can you can focus all that energy into one point. So if it's almost like ears, you're listening. You know, if you put your hands up to your ears like this, you can hear better. It's because you're reflecting all the sound into your, into your ears. And it's, that's the same idea, except it's a perfect shape. It's a parabola. And what that does is it focuses all that, that sound or light or electromagnetic radiation, like, like um, our cell phones. It focuses on the one thing. So cell phone towers use the same, uh, concept. Okay. Cell phone towers, and we all use our cell phones to communicate, right? And so right now, you know, if I get my cell phone, my cell phone right now is sending electromagnetic signals out in every direction. Your phone's doing the same thing. It's sending out. And if I make a phone call, what happens is this. Roughly. Okay. This is a rough idea of what happens. Here I am, right? I've got my phone in my hand. And somewhere near me, within a few miles, there's a big tower. 
And on it, it has these, usually they look like these little boxes like this, but those are actually parabolic inside of them. They look like little parabolas. And so what they're doing is they're listening. Okay, and when I say listening, they're, they're sitting there, they're aimed in different directions. My phone, if I make a phone call, my phone sends out signals in every direction, right? One of these towers is going to get that signal. It's gonna reflect off that par parabola and it has like this curve and then it has this point right here and there's actually what's called a receiver there. When my signal comes in that gets to that point there, gets focused to that point, that signal gets sent down to the processor which says, okay, this person's trying to make a call. And then what this tower does is then it sends out that, that same signal and then somewhere around me, there's another tower right? And, and it gets that signal, and then it sends that signal out. And eventually, it might go through several towers, right? It might go from me to a tower, to another tower, to another tower. And then here's the person I'm trying to call, right? This tower, this person's phone was sending out signals saying, here I am, okay? So this tower knows this person is here. When this tower gets this signal, it, it says, oh, I need to get it to this person. So it sends it, sends it, and that signal goes through. It's a little more complicated than this, but basically when you call someone, it's just a bunch of parabolas that are listening for your signal and, and sending that out. And it's all happening at the speed of light. And so when you sit there and you, you know, call someone, your voice is going through this, this chain of events right here. And it's all happening so quickly. We don't even notice that there's, a, there's no delay in it. If I send a text message to somebody with a picture, all that, that picture that I send is going to be broken down to a bunch of zeros and ones. And it's sent through here and somebody gets the picture, right? It's, it's absolutely insane when you think about how much stuff is floating around us that we can't see, right? All these, all these electrical signals. Um, in fact, if we could see them, it would be blinding. It would be like someone turning on a light that would just blind you. You wouldn't even be able to see. So it's a good thing that the, the, um, the signals that we're sending through our phones are not visible, right? Um, they're electromagnetic waves, but they're not in our visible spectrum. So we can't see the waves. If we could, we'd be blinded. So that's a really good um, application of parabolas. Without parabolas, you can't, we can't communicate with each other like this. Um, another last thing um, with this um, cell phone thing is if you're trying, like, let's say this is the earth, right? And you want to send a, you know, want to call somebody who's on the other side of the planet, right? Well, we can do the same thing. There's cell phone tower here and and another cell phone tower. But the problem is we've got oceans, right? We've got oceans between us. So, you know, we can't, we can't uh, have towers in the middle of the ocean. So what we do instead is up in space, we have satellites up here, right? And so these signals get sent to a satellite that same thing, parabolic mirror or parabolic receiver, it receives that signal. It sends it to another satellite over here and then that goes to another satellite over here. And then eventually goes down to the ground to a tower and then eventually goes to that person. And again, it's all happening at the speed of light. So if you make a call to someone on the other side of the world, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag, a little bit of a delay. It's really not that noticeable nowadays, but it's because that signal's got to go, you know, through a few towers up into space across a couple of satellites and back down. And it's all happening so quickly. So it's it's really amazing when you when you really think about it. It's it's crazy. How do these towers sort through? I mean, think about how many people might be if you go to like a Spurs game or something. You've got like you know fifteen thousand people sitting there. They all have their phones on. All this electromagnetic radiation is going everywhere. How does the cell phone tower sort through all that and say this person is calling this person? Right. There, that's a lot of lot of technology going on there. So and then also, is it secure? Like, is it easy? Can someone listen to it? Can somebody actually um, receive that? Like if your signal's going out, everyone can hear it. So is there a way that you can protect that? And I talked to you all about this earlier this semester, this that RSA encryption thing. So anyways, it's parabolas are 
are extremely um, valuable to us in the real world. Um, another just real simple example is a flashlight. Um, if, you, if you have ever had a flashlight that has, has the ability where this thing at the front of the flashlight, you can turn it. And when you turn it, what it does is it, it impacts the beam. So maybe if you have it, you know, turn it on, the beam's coming out straight. But if you turn that thing, what happens is it spreads the beam out. All that's happening there is you have a light in here, right? You have a light and it's sending out light rays in every direction. And behind, inside here, right back in here, there's a mirror, okay? It's parabolic. And when the light rays hit that, it reflects off and goes straight out, which is what makes parabolas parabolas. Everything comes straight out. When you turn, when you turn the actual end of the flashlight, what you're doing is you're moving this mirror back and forth. Sometimes you're moving the light back and forth, but a lot of times it's just a mirror that goes back and forth. And when you move the mirror away, what it does is it has the effect of spreading things out. So that's all you're doing. You're using a parabolic mirror and moving that mirror back and forth. Our headlights work the same way on our cars, right? If you look at your headlight behind the light bulb, you'll see a mirror. That's a parabolic shape back there so that your light comes out as a beam in the road, on the road, instead of just spread out everywhere. Um, your high beams, right? And your low beams are different, right? And that they have figured out like what beam is best for those two scenarios. So anyways, I can keep going on. Um, I wanna show one more thing, promise this is the last one. Um, really, if you go back in history, this is a castle. I know it looks like a castle. This is a castle, you know, back in the day, you know, you would have these castles and then you'd have these people living in the castle. They'd have their little city. And then these other people would come and they'd be like, hey, you know, we want all your shit, right? We want your, your food. We want your, all your valuables, right? People don't get along historically. We like to fight with each other, right? So how do you storm the castle? Well, you start to, you know, you make a catapult over here and you start launching shit into this castle, fireballs and things like that. Well, you can just throw things and hope to hit what you want to hit. But if you know that this is a parabola, if you can understand the math behind this, right, the f of x, if you can figure out the math behind that parabola, then you can launch something and you can put it exactly where you want to put it. And the cultures and civilizations that embraced the technology with the math, they were able to become better at that faster than the other cultures or civilizations. So if you've got one group that's just launching stuff randomly, and then you've got another group who's putting things exactly where they want them, then that group that has the math behind it is going to, to come out on top most of the time. And technology is always pushed, like, well, the fact that humans don't get along, right? The fact that we're always at war with one another, that has pushed technology, right? That has pushed math. That has pushed, it's sad, but that's the way it has been in the world, is that the, the fact that we don't get along, right, has made us very, very smart when it comes to um, weapons, right? Now, think about it. You can, you can send from underwater, right, out of a submarine, you can send a rocket to anywhere in the world and put it exactly where you want it, right? I mean, it's, and we've come a long way from throwing fireballs, right? But the technology, the mathematics behind all of that is, is pretty involved. So a parabola is like the very beginning of understanding motion with objects, all right? So that's why we study them, because they're in the real world. Um, they're used every day. So our understanding of them is, is important. I hope that that gives you some perspective as to why we even study these. I mean, like, what's the point of a parabola, right? Well, there's a lot of points to a parabola. Okay, um, all right, so if I give you something in uh, vertex form, we should be able to graph it. Now, there's something else that um, we have, I've conveniently avoided in this. And let me take this thing out of here. I'm gonna adjust some values here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move these things around, okay? So 
if I move, we already know how H and K affects the graph, right? It moves things up and down. If let's say I'm looking at that right there, notice that, let me, you know what? I'm gonna open it the other way. Let me open it. So it looks like, like I'm throwing something. Okay, like that's an object that's been thrown. Notice that there are two points here where the graph hits the x-axis. These are called our x-intercepts. And in this case, we have two of them, don't we? We have two x-intercepts. And it would be really nice if we could figure out where they were. Because when you think about an object being thrown, that's where the object would hit the ground, all right? So if I throw something through the air, it travels like a parabola, then that x-intercept is where that object would land. So it'd be nice if I had a function, if I could find those, right? So my, my first question to you to think about here is, <clears throat> Let's say that I give you a parabola, right? Let's say that I give you a parabola, f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Let's say I give you a parabola and it's in that form. How many x-intercepts are possible? So let me draw you one scenario. We could have something like this, right? And here we have two x-intercepts, don't we? Is it possible to have one? What if we have this? What if our vertex is the point that actually hits the x-axis? Then I'd only have one x-intercept, wouldn't I? So it's possible to have two, it's possible to have one. Is it possible to have none? Sure, look at that scenario, right? Also, they don't have to open down. You could have a parabola open up. Let me give you an example of a parabola that opens up that has two x-intercepts. An example of a parabola that opens up that has one x-intercept and, and a parabola that opens up that has no x-intercepts. So there, here, there are two x-intercepts. Here there's one x-intercept, and here there's none, no x-intercepts. Is it possible to have three? If the shape is a U, right, if it looks like a U, there's no way that you could hit the graph more than twice. So with all parabolas, you, you always have either two, one, or none. With all parabolas, you have two, one, or no, no x-intercepts. The question for us now is how do you find them? So to find the x-intercepts of a quadratic function, all we do is take the function and set it equal to zero. That's it. All we're trying to do is figure out when that function spits out zero. Which means we have to solve a quadratic equation, which is why we just spent the last day or so learning how to solve quadratic equations. So that when we get to a quadratic function, we can figure out where it hits the x-axis. All right, let's go back to this problem that I gave you here, right? I said, hey, here's a quadratic function. I wanted to know if it opened up or down. I wanted to know what the vertex was. I wanted you to do a sketch. I wanted the axis of symmetry. But now what I'd like to add to this is another note or another um, thing I'm looking for. Fifth thing, let's find the x-intercepts, if you have any. Do we with this one? Do we have x-intercepts for this one? Do you know? I mean, you already drew the picture, didn't you? It was, 
Oh, go to the right three, go down eight, get a vertex and it opened up, right? Like this. So we knew already that we should have two. We just don't know what they are. So I'm gonna take, to solve, to figure out the x-intercepts, I'm going to take the original function and set it equal to zero, right? That's what I'm gonna do here. Now, the question is how do we solve this, right? This is a quadratic function. Notice that I already have something being squared here. So I'm gonna use what we call the square root property. I'm going to add eight to both sides first. Then I'm gonna divide both sides by four. What I'm trying to do is get that parenthesis thing by itself. Eight divided by four is two. Now I'm gonna take the square root on both sides, which makes me have to do plus or minus. The left side, the root and the square go away. I just get X minus three equals plus or minus the square root of two. And finally, I'm going to add three to both sides. So you get plus or minus root two and then plus three. Those are my two X intercepts right there. However, I want to know where these are on the x-axis. So I'm going to get my calculator out, and I'm going to figure out what the square root of 2 is on my calculator. And when I do that, I'm going to get two approximate answers. I'm going to get plus or minus. Now, square root 2 on my calculator is about 1.414, and then plus 3. So I'm just doing that on my calculator. And now remember, this is two different, two different scenarios you have to look at here. You have the positive and the negative. So I'm gonna do 1.414 plus three, then I'm gonna do 1.414 minus three. The first one is 4.1414. Oh. And the second one's gonna be a little bit harder. Let me see here, 1.414 minus three. Yeah, negative 1.586. Those are my two x-intercepts. So if I go now and look at that graph that we had here, um, I'm gonna have to redo this. It was four x, oh, let me see, this was four. This was three, this was negative eight, right? That was it right there. I just found these two x-intercepts. I'm gonna have the computer graph them. The first x-intercept we found was 4.414 was the x. So 4.414. That's the X coordinate. The Y coordinate is zero because we're on the X axis. So there's that point there in blue. And then the other one was, wait a minute, did I get, oh, I messed up. I messed up, my fault, hold on. I did this backwards, this is my fault. I'm glad I'm checking this. Um, Y'all should have said something. This is a plus three here. This is a plus three that was a minus in front here. The plus and the minus is on the one point. This is not right. I would have known that as soon as I graphed it. I was supposed to do negative, I don't know why I did that, negative 1.414 and then plus three. Okay, it's positive 1.586. Okay, so if I do that over here, positive 1.586 comma zero, I get that second x-intercept right there. So you can see we found the two places where we hit the x-axis. 
Questions on this? So let's just talk about what I did one more time. Whenever you have it in this form of a vertex form, to find the x-intercepts, you move this number over, you divide by the A, you do square root on both sides, plus or minus, and then you get the decimal answers. I'm gonna give you one to do right now. So I'm gonna do the same set of instructions here, everything here, okay? You know what, I don't think this is gonna copy. Let's see, copy that, let's try this. Oh, it actually worked. Okay, new problem. Let's go with this. So let's go negative three X. Let's go with plus two squared. Mm. Plus, one, uh, I'm trying to keep the numbers nice for you. Um, let's go plus 12. There we go. All right, see if you can answer all these questions. Does it open up or down? What's the vertex? Do a quick sketch, okay? Then find the, equ the equation of the x symmetry, and then go find the x-intercepts. All right, go for it.
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, Desmos. I'm going to graph this, and that's how we're going to check our answers to see if you got this right. So negative three x. So I'm going to do it a little different here. I'm just going to get rid of all this. So I'm typing here f of x equals negative three, and then x plus two squared plus 12, and your vertex should be the point negative to 12, and your x-intercepts should be negative four zero and zero zero. Your axis of symmetry is x equals negative two, Okay, I'm gonna just put that all up there. I'm not showing any of the work. Um, I'll answer questions if you didn't get those, but that, that should be everything you need to answer those questions. You've got, it opens down. You've got a vertex of negative 212. You've got X, two X intercepts. All right, so here's what I'd like for you to do because we're wrapping up today. For homework, I would like for you to do these six problems. All right. And what I want you to do for these six problems, you can take a picture of the screen if you want, or however you think, I'll leave this up for a while. These six problems, I want you to do the same instructions that I just gave you. All right. So for the problem that you just did, you're going to be figuring out if it opens up or down. You want to find the vertex. You want to do a little quick sketch. You want to find the um, axis of symmetry, and then you want to find the x-intercepts. All right. Do not do the 19.4 homework from online, all right? I'm actually gonna remove that assignment. Let me, let me pause this so it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I'm going to remove that assignment completely. So 19.4, stay in there. Okay, so 19.4 should no longer show up. All right. So that's it. That's all I want you to do for homework is just do those six problems. And we can come and talk about that. Um, remember, tomorrow's a holiday. I'll see you on Wednesday. I'm going to have to wrap a few things up. Okay, I still want to show you a little bit of the standard form and like how to get from one form to the other. But we should be able to spend a good, I don't know, hour and a half on review for the exam. Um, I did send out over the weekend, I did send out two documents. One of them was called exam three. Just ignore that it says three here. This is an old exam and we're actually not gonna be doing this whole thing. We're gonna start at number four. 15, I believe. Yeah, number 15 is where we're going to start the review on this. Okay, so on that one, it's number 15 and on. That's where we're going to start the review. And then the other document that I sent is says 30320 uh, final. This is just an old final. So there's a bunch of factoring that we're going to be doing. Um, another you know, solving, solving, well, I should say this is, this right here is solving um, quadratic equations, more solving quadratic equations. Now these are not quadratic, these are something else. Okay, that's what we did today, where they look kind of like quadratics. We also did this today. And then we did radical equations a few days ago. And then this is what we were doing today. We've got functions. See, these are in standard form though. So that's why we need to talk about standard form. All right. So that is what we'll do next time. We'll talk standard form. We'll get into the review. All right.
Okay, y'all have a good uh, rest of your day and have a good holiday. I'll hang out here for a moment if anyone has any questions over this problem that uh, or anything else, I'll hang out for a moment. If not, have a good day, have a good holiday, see you Wednesday. Oh, professor. Yes, uh-huh. Sorry, I have a question. Um, yes. There's a few homework that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for you to open it? You'll need to send me an email and request and say exactly what assignments you want opened. Sure, I would do that. Thank you. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. Have a good day. Yep. Hey, so on the, um, the extra credit for the questions uh when are you going to put those points in for for which ones what, what are you talking about specifically um the it was like six i think it was six questions like the questions we had to submit to uh canvas and you yeah put... okay yeah i have not done those yet um i will let me uh let me look at something real quick let me make sure that they're there um, I'm pausing my screen in case I have to bring up grades. I don't want anyone to see. I just want to make sure it's here. Um, grades. I think I've made a special category for these. All right. Let's see here. Bonus completing the square, that one? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have not put that in yet. Um, I do see that you did submit something. So I will get to that and it will count as a bonus. Um, I can tell you how much it's worth. Let's see here. 1.25. So it's worth 1.25%, uh, which is pretty big um, curve considering it's, you know, entire point, 1.25 points over your overall grade in the class. So. It's a pretty significant um, little bonus. Okay. Yeah, I'll cool. get to it. Probably not right away. I'm gonna just, you know, what I'll do is I probably won't address that until I get till after we take our final and I'm getting all the grades together. But if you did it, um, you can imagine whatever your grade is right now, add 1.25 points to it and that's where you are. Okay. Okay. Sounds okay. Good. Yeah. okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Ryan. Brian, question? Um, for the homework, um, you said we do those 